Thank you so much for coming here. Uh, even though the numbers of people are more intimidating than I thought, but uh, it's really uh, a tribute to both of us, I think. And it's not excessive to think that way, uh, because as we were parallel in our career, I think we affected more than a wide swath of people, both as teachers and people who saw our work and who were uh, enlightened by it, enthused by it, encouraged by it, uh, unbeknownst to us, because it was not our goal. And in, in fact, the intimacy of our relationship was such that it was almost exclusive of the public in a way, even though we were both very much involved with public exposure, with, with all our, our, and any artist would be, that there was a duality both in our, in our feeling about the, about the art world which was complicated, to say the least. Uh, and it's, it's so uh, surprising that somebody uh, remarked about how we affected the whole thrust towards realism. Because at the outset, we were totally pessimistic about its prospects. And that was a central part of our relationship also. Um, and I go on to explain that as I show uh, some of the pictures that I think are important in this kind of discovery and uh, about which I find an interesting relationship. Uh, the picture you see on the screen is, is interesting for me. I had seen Harvey's self-portrait and when, <clears throat> when he got out of the army. And I understood the expression, which is one both of resentment, childhood pouting, and, and a curious intensity. Uh, because we had, in fact, both been uh, drafted at the same time and, and been uh, exposed to varying exp experiences in the Army. But the central fact of it was that we hated both our, our, our time and service for a very important reason. That was, and I use that word tentatively, a political reason. It was the Korean War that happened within five years after the most extraordinary uh, attempt to destroy fascism in the world. And here we were suddenly reversed and becoming a, an imperialist power, intervening in a part of the world under the guise of the newfound uh, uh, kind of diagram of international relationships, which was the threat of the Soviet Union and the atom bomb. Let me start at the beginning, beginning. Uh, there was something about our friendship also that was unique, and that was to be carried on <laughs> But that was a later development because, because at the beginning, beginning, we started out as kids in a very exciting high school, started by Maya LaGuardia called Music and Art, the High School of Music and Art. But the interesting thing about this group of friendships, by the way, that creature, creature, creature on the left, lower left, right next to Harvey on the right of him, or the left of him, right? You know who that is? 
with the silly expression on his face, that's me. <laughs> okay, I look like I was 12 years old. Uh, the interesting thing about our position in the high school is that we were both part of a group of curious deviants <laughs> that we were interested in drawing and painting realistically. That it was something at odds with one, I, I would think, the most progressive high school in the city in terms not only of its art, but of its academic programs as well. And everyone in the teaching staff was hung up on what would be post Cezanne developments. That is, everything after started, that started before Cezanne was largely unimportant, uninteresting, and not something part of our potential learning. And it was up, so opposed to what we were thinking and feeling that uh, we were almost isolated and identified within the high school as a group. And interestingly, it was a forbearance, or, of, or rather, a, a, an indication of where we would be 10 years from then, and even throughout our careers. Somebody literally, I hate to say it, revolutionaries, but at odds with the prevailing environment, which I will, I will get to and talk about. And this is a dual picture of ourselves in the service. And I really like the one on the right because it shows me as a very dedicated American patriot. <laughs> uh, we developed as, as both social animals. We would all go to similar openings and we wound up going to similar galleries. Uh, and it's curious because, uh, and this is probably, I guess, what was it? It was 1964. Uh, and it was also in a very early stage of our showing at galleries, and, and, and yet at the same time, we had a kind of uh, understanding about what our role was, that it was both uh, in, in the paintings that we did and in the way we presented ourselves, which of course led to something which is interesting. By 1967, we'd grown chin hair, which is more appropriate for, for our distinguished place in the world. And we worked together on producing portfolios of our drawings. The gallery that we was, were both in at the time uh, was in Philadelphia, and the dealer was very adventuresome and uh, produced um, portfolios of our drawings. I, I was going to show those, but there's, there's too much to see. And we, we were all optimistic about the possibility of selling these important portfolios. Of course, it was <laughs> a t total commercial disaster, but nevertheless, it, it continued. The third person on in this photograph is another good friend, an, an artist named Dan Schwartz, who was a, 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 an enormous influence on American illustration and a terrific painter who suffered more from not being seen as much and as often as he should have been. Uh, the, the sequence of events, of course, that produced this funny photograph was part and partial of what was changing in America. And it was certainly the, uh, I, I think, the, a, a period of time that was really fascinating. And uh, I think to some extent, uh, unprecedented was the period of the 60s. And the revolutions that took place at the end of that decade affected in a political and social life 
for decades to come. Uh, in the interval, Harvey also had a, a, a medal from the uh, Portrait Society of America, which in fact was a, uh, a one organization that I helped start to promote the idea that portraits could actually be paintings and not relegated to a sort of subcategory <laughs> of, of endeavor close to the cleaning department. Uh, and uh, it, it's important to take note of, of this photograph uh, because Harvey is, is seated next to me and he has his arm around my shoulder. And I didn't notice that until I went back and looked at these few photographs, by the way, are all that's left or that remains of our early days together. And you have to understand this is a day, a, a, a time when people made a phone call by running their finger around the dial. <laughs> uh, and so the people did not carry cameras and didn't record events up to very recently when it's now been over recorded. But uh, I point this out because I think in some way Harvey considered me like an errant other member of the family who had to be kept in tow and uh, in fact protected in some way. And this was a meeting at, at uh, a dinner of one of the dinners that we attended. And this was an occasional shot when I began to teach again at the Art Students League and ran into him uh, down in the lobby. And somebody was so amused, but this, <laughs> this guy who looks like a used car salesman, <laughs> that uh, uh, they shot this photograph of him. And very soon after that, Harvey came to visit, which was something we had sort of not done after so many years. We used to visit Harvey and Lois at their home on President Street in Brooklyn on a regular basis. And uh, it was an occasion where he was teaching in the neighborhood, or, or he'd just come from the league, and he decided to come up and, and chat with us. So we spent this lovely afternoon uh, considering all the things that had happened to us and all the worlds we would had traveled. Uh, and this is an event very soon after that and very recently in 2018 when he called me. Harvey would used to sort of <laughs> Not disappear, but I wouldn't hear from him for days, nor I called him. Somehow or other, I just assumed he would always be there. And uh, he called and said he wanted to go up to the Met, would I take, take a walk with him? And uh, I noticed... Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> to continue, very quickly, we, we, we walked around the Met and he said something that was almost premonitory and I worried about it. He was very tired and that was not something I associated with Harvey because it, in, in so many instances he seemed to be uh, immune to fatigue. Uh, and we sat and talked for a while, and then we continued on the way, and suddenly somebody passed us by who was apparently amused by these old Dodgers in the museum, and decided, asked to take our picture. And I transcribed, I gave him my telephone, to, to my phone to do it. And I said, I'll send it to you, which of course I never did. <laughs> but again, notice something else, that 
He took a picture with me with his arm around my shoulder. And I made no notice of that until I was going over photographs that we had. And it struck me that, again, there was something I misunderstood about our long-term relationship, is that in some sense he was afraid that I was going to fly off the handle, like I did early on in our experience. Uh, this is uh, the last time I saw this friend of mine, Dan Schwartz, before he also died. And Harvey showed up at a, at a memorial service for uh, David Levine's former wife, who lived in the neighborhood right around the corner from us, up on the Upper West Side. And uh, he was standing there listening to the people making speeches, and I saw his profile, and I said, this is ridiculous, this is not a 90-year-old man. And I put it side by side with that early photograph, and it was a remarkable kind of comparison. This little... Uh, event in our lives was a, an extraordinary one. And it happened quite precipitously, because Harvey was on the phone talking with me about an article by a, a, a well-known and very articulate New York Post correspondent named Murray Kempton, who was a brilliant writer and a kind of aristocratic liberal. And he was one of the few people who went down to this small town in the South to record a bus strike. And no one in the press at the time paid much attention to it. And Harvey was talking to me on the phone about some chit-chat, and then he mentioned Kempton's articles, and suddenly he said, let's go there and draw it. And I hesitated for a millisecond, and I said, yeah, let's. And out of that, came something, I think, that was extraordinary in both our experience, because it changed two things. It changed our sense of possibility as artists in affecting some kind of sense of, of what we were about as, as, as artists, to reach out on larger issues than was what apparently was also being done at the time. And it was also a dramatic change in, in the way we did drawings. Much of our early training and inspiration came from rather traditional sources. Uh, oh, I went to this photograph I recently discovered I didn't have uh, because we decided to go with Lois going with us to take notes because she thought in her prescience as an art historian that it was important enough to record. And over the years, I've tried to ask if somehow or other we could retrieve those notes uh, because I thought it would add to the history of where we were and what we did. But apparently, that was not forthcoming. And so, in that period of time of about 10 days, we learned something about ourselves as artists, and we learned an enormous amount about what was happening in the South that was, again, not recorded by newspapers at the time. And it was, as this note says, we were innocent as doves on a, a branch because we had no way of understanding what would happen when two Northerners and two Jews came riding into the Bible Belt in the heart of segregation. And I emphasize the last characterization, Jews, because it was the first time we even thought of ourselves in that way. Uh, 
And something was, of course, unforeseen for us because we were then young, without our beards, we looked like neophytes, and I think uh, the people of Montgomery were extraordinarily uh, welcoming to us for another reason because we came there to record what they were doing. And there's nothing so flattering as painting somebody's portrait. And it, uh, we were invited into people's homes. We were made welcome at uh, rallies. These are drawings that Harvey did, by the way. They're a marvelous portrait of this guy who, who, whose role was important in something called the Montgomery Improvement Association, which is a political organization. And they, they're really extraordinary. I thought his drawings were terrific. Uh, and the drawing on the left is of Rosa Parks also, because he was able to get into our home, and uh, she was, he was invited in and did a, this wonderful drawing of her. Uh, and the interesting thing is, these are drawings of mine, but you could have easily mistaken them for Harvey's. Uh, it would be an interesting kind of confusion because one of the few reviews of the, the exhibition that was going to be taking place is another of my drawings. I really got off on the, on the uh, on the, on the juries that we sat in when Martin King was put on trial because people stood still <laughs> for, <laughs> for the first time. And it was this exhibition at our gallery then called the Davis Gallery, which is unusual for them because they were devoted to these very intimate paintings uh, from the 19th century. And the show was put on with a great deal of trepidation on the part of the dealer for an interesting reason. Because he didn't want to confuse these drawings as illustrations. He was terrified of the possible obloquy, that's a nice word for many people sneering at him, and saying, oh, you're showing the illustration now. You know, those people who actually get hired for their services. Uh, so he called it the artist's reporter, which is a slightly evasive thing, but really adds to the same thing. But there was a precedent for it, because back in the turn of the century, there was a group of artists called the Eight, who were newspaper reporters first, who became part of something called the Ashcan School. And they, were all, they also started as people who would draw uh, news events before the camera became so available as a, as a reporter's instrument, and uh, who then developed into painting a lot of their, their, their own world around the Lower East Side on the idea that art should now be devoted to the underclass, to the people who were ignored. And the exhibition note said something. It said, it's in this little fragment, which I saved, which I thought was very archival of me, which I don't usually do. Uh, and the, on the right-hand side is a little quote. It said, the drawing show uh, in New York Times uh, said, the sketches of one are indistinguishable from the other. And I wrote, and actually, that was pretty accurate. But I think what it meant was that it fused the both of our efforts in the service of what we were doing, which is recording a public event of importance. So our personality differences were not important. But it affected both of us, I think. We became a little bit nervous about that. Uh, every artist uh, wants to establish his own signature and his own identity. But in the years that followed, that was not to be the case. The interesting thing that happened 
two years later, was uh, the editor of the then predominant art magazine in America called Art News, uh, which was a proponent, an art, an art proponent of the new modernist uh, uh, er er eruption that had taken place in American art. Uh, a guy named Thomas Hess. And he called us and said, why don't you write an article about the eight? That's like the things you did, right? And a mixture of consternation, worry, flattery took place. So we decided, okay, sure. And I reread the article recently. Oh, holy mackerel. I never hear this phone at home. <laughs> shut, shut it off. Uh, and so he wrote this piece that was interesting because it was a takedown of the, uh, of the whole group that we were looking at. It was a disparagement of the eight and the fact that their work was too incidental, it's too much related to a moment that it exploited very... Uh, momentary experiences in the environment in the Lower East Side that they were working with. And it surprised Hess, of course. And as a consequence, he called us again and said, would you like to write another article? <laughs> Which we declined. And the article is interesting. I don't know quite how much combination it was written by or the Harvey or myself. We had so accustomed ourselves to working as a unit that, that neither of us wanted to take particular uh, uh, presence in that. Um, and I think this, this, there's something else that was going on that we did not anticipate. Because the New York Post, by the way, uh, published a at least three or four of these drawings with articles about roughly about what was happening uh, in relation to civil rights in the South. But remember, this was early on. This was 1958. And it was only in the years following that the great disruptions in civil rights movement began to take place in which there were... Uh, these violent kinds of response to the idea of a black America actually having a voice in this country. Uh, the, the elements of bombings in Birmingham uh, and the, the attack of the march <coughs> on Selma, which became celebrated in a, in a way that, as a matter of fact, obscured the whole beginnings in Montgomery. But it also engendered an interest in somebody else. And, uh, and this was 10 years after, after the, the, the drawings had virtually disappeared. Uh, and <coughs> Esquire magazine took over a sudden proprietary interest in it. And as a result of that, other things began to happen. The, the fact that they would had taken a full-page spread to, to memorialize that, led eventually to something else, which was uh, 50 years later. And it sounds like a great span between 1968 and, and 19, <coughs> 2006. But it was, if I can change the, the chronology of this, it was, by the way, this was very recently, in, in 2018, or 2018, yes. The Montgomery Museum, which in the interval had also acquired over 45 of the drawings, uh, of a, a, a batch of almost 75 drawings that were acquired both by museums and private individuals all the drawings entered into a public space. And the fact that 
This had been shown yet another 12 years after the show in 2006, which was a multiple exhibition both at the Delaware Art Museum and in, uh, uh, and in Montgomery, where we went and were then given a royal welcome by the Southern Poverty Law Association, which had been fighting racism for 50 years in Montgomery. And we learned a great deal about what was, in fact, the terror that was not visible when we went there. Uh, one of the incidents that was, of course, on my part, a, a lack of judgment, I decided, and we had already been treated so well in Montgomery, to backtrack a little, <laughs> that I decided to go to the opening of the New York, of the Montgomery legislature. It was the opening session of the Senate. And I thought, okay, I'm going to go there, maybe I'll do some drawings. Because I was prompted by Murray Kempton's description of the legislature as a pack of used car salesmen. So I thought that was a good starting point. And of course, what happened is I was sitting there making drawings that were mildly like caricatures and didn't notice that behind me there was a very large human being who is the court bailiff. <laughs> and I turned around and, I, and he said to me in this sonorous voice, I'll take those drawings now. Uh, and I said, well, Mr. <laughs> the, the by drawings, he said, I'll take them now. And what ensued, of course, was uh, a scary moment because the open session of the legislature and the speaker said, I have here drawings by Mr. Burton Silverman, son of our legislature. Uh, and I think we're going to confiscate those now. <laughs> so I said, under my breath, you can have them. <laughs> and I really was very worried because the audience was not exactly threatening, but I had a feeling of great tension. And as I left the space, uh, there were a couple of reporters from Montgomery newspaper and from the north, and one guy who's from the AP patted me on the shoulder. He says, "It's okay, buddy. Scam." And that was. And I reported it back to Harvey. He said to me, "Why did you go there, <laughs> schmuck?" <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but in retrospect, I think there was something unprecedented in this experience because no one in American art had dealt with an event of this kind before. Uh, and I think, in thinking back on it, I was trying to make some sense of what was accomplished. The fact that it was in museums and exhibitions and so on. And I, I thought two things. One, that it was very selfish. I think we never talked about it, but I, I felt we had finally found a place in a public arena that we were operating as artists. But also underneath, it was something else that I think both of us who were liberal, if not radical in our temperament, thought we just wanted to be a part of an, a, a movement against injustice. They, we wanted to say no, that this was our way of doing it. That was personal and that we both shared. Uh, and that was one of the many things, or at least the central things that we shared about, about the world, about not only the the political world, which we thought was inescapably bound to the artistic one, is that we were in some kind of struggle for the right, the good against the evil. 
Uh, and I hate to, to categorize uh, the alternate forms of, of art experience that way. But something else also which is important, and now it begins to, to go to the kind of former art that we felt encouraged by. This was part of a series by Goya called The Disasters of War. And he did a whole series of etchings that were profoundly moving. I think one of my family members here would be very understanding of that. And, and this was by uh, a woman who's now being celebrated belatedly by the Museum of Modern Art. Aha! They discovered a wonderful woman artist. Emphasis on woman, okay? And thinking, I'd never been free of being pissed off at things, but I kept saying to myself, yeah, but we knew about Kate Colvitz 50 years ago. And in my studio, and that's one of the most powerful etchings of hers that I responded to. Uh, and the other part of it was that we also looked, I, I, I'm going to throw this back, this is an interesting thing by Winslow Homer. People didn't know about Homer as a reporter, as other people did. And this is an incredible painting of his, of a sharpshooter in the Civil War. He did many others. I, I, would, I wouldn't uh, uh, take time to, to say this to you, I mean, to show it to you. But it was also part of the credential that I think we were looking for that art had a place. I don't think people know about this painter, Meissonier, who was uh, Napoleon's kind of primary artist. And this is, as you can see, it's a, a pretty good painting, large size. But it doesn't compare to my buddy Harvey's <laughs> paintings. I got news for you. <laughs> I mean, but at the time, it was a, a celebration of the Napoleonic uh, majesty. And, and the, it interestingly did something for Harvey because he suddenly sounds himself as an illustrator. Something that he, I think, did not look for but happened to him. And I know over the years uh, Harvey used to dismiss any of the illustration he did. But on balance, when I think about it, and I think about the prior two paintings that I did, that there was something about his own heritage that he was not making a connection to. That in fact, the work that he did as an illustrator was connected in many ways to his private interests, the painting he did of his family, and the paintings he did of of Jews, of uh, with conventional religious attire, and it was it it was an important part of his training. And of course, I was also doing illustration, and it was a funny kind of coincidence. We never talked about it, other than when he was in fact. Uh, hired, uh, and this was, <laughs> by the way, the, pa the painting on my left may be my only <clears throat> access to immortality. <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting that, that both of us were involved in similar areas of illustration. But it ended very quickly after this point in time, and I think the drawing that Harvey did on the U.S. News Magazine was uh, either something that he had in hand, or he was uh, uh, he was actually hired for at the time. I don't think he did any illustration past uh, 1970. Uh, but 
this is a wonderful photograph I found uh, of Harvey in the midst of what was that tumultuous de de decade of the 60s when he was, in fact, working as an illustrator. And he went to, uh, in this incredible summer, oh, I, I jumped the gun a minute, yeah, okay. Uh, I had to remind him that our favorite woman artist, Kate Kovitz, was also involved in the same, same uh, process. And he was sent to various very important events, including the, the summer of, of 1968 with the, uh, the war on poverty where Martin King came to speak to Washington. And the drawings that he did also are interesting because they suddenly evoked the sense of where his art was going to go. And he did this as a very a special uh, private uh, uh, pastel of his own. I don't think it was used in the illustration. And I think that that picture of him as part of the movement was also very important to him. And you see him with camera in hand because it became apparent that in so many of these events you could not just continue to draw uh, on the spot as, as gifted and talented as he won. Uh, but it was, again, something adverse to the background of what he was interested in, which is certainly the history that went back to the 5th, 14th century, 15th century and Flemish painting, and particularly to the art of Thomas Aikens, which always served as a model for him. And this particular uh, painting is a huge one also in scale, and I think it began to affect his thinking about scale. Uh, and these are paintings from this, uh, Spain back in the 16th century, including I was always intrigued by this painting by Giuseppe Ribera, which is, again, a notion that, that art had a relevance. And then, in the midst of all this, something else happened, which was, in fact, the insistent elimination of all uh, opposition. This is a painting by Franz Klein, which, again, this wonderful photograph of uh, a Barnett Newman painting, it's probably about 20 feet wide, with a single stripe running it down. I love that. Uh, and this painting also, which gave one an indication of what had happened to all the things that we felt were valuable in American art and in art in general. And it set the stage for what was going to be a lifelong conflict. But it generated something else, which was, in fact, a futile exhibition that we planned for showing how important realist art was. And this, in fact, is a, apparently a, an iconic picture. It appears or appeared in magazines Again, and I can see Harvey in the central area there, and I'm off on the side. Uh, and this was, again, in 1961, before all of the events I'd just shown about. And Raphael Sawyer, who Harvey had studied with here at the League, had done a painting of all of those at, uh, who were connected with the Davis Gallery, which is where we were all located. And why was this important? because he thought we were all a kind of band of brothers that were involved in a certain kind of art that he favored. It turned out that he didn't favor it so much because he was caught up in the, uh, and this painting was in his memorial, or <clears throat> his wonderful exhibition at the uh, Whitney Museum. Uh, and, and he was friendly with a, a, uh, an art teacher named Milton Brown, who worked at Brooklyn College with uh, and knew Lois. 
And Raphael decided that he was going to look at all our work and tell us what was important. And part of what he thought was important was to hook on to the whole modernist revolution. I looked at this painting and I kept saying, what's so interesting about that lump in the middle? Okay. And because I'm such a dullard, I didn't realize that Cezanne missed Mount Saint Lacroix, that this was the dominant white, white bit of granite sitting in, in, the, in the plains. And, and there's something so ca characteristic about missing the point that that painting I showed you was all about paint. Uh, and something also was happening that in the world around us that was easily uh, changing in our, our feeling. Uh, and I think Harvey began to feel that whatever the struggle was, uh, it was really not significant anymore. And with the birth of his first child, of Rachel, uh, he began to develop a more intense interest in things of the family and painting things that were close to him. The drawing on the right is also my response to a new family. Uh, and I, I throw it in because it has all the characteristics of something he might have done. Uh, and the earliest paintings he did of Lois, Lois pregnant with Michael, was in the period where they had moved to Poughkeepsie. And things began to happen with Harvey's paintings now that began to show his focus, that you could see in the exhibition here. Uh, this is a beautiful kind of reminiscence, almost of a, uh, a, a, a Dutch interior. Uh, and Harvey's incredible skills are manifest in so many ways. Uh, something else happened after the period. I'm giving you a, a mixed chronology. I hope you can bear with me because psh, uh, my organizational sense is a little poor, but <laughs> very poor. Uh, it, it was done in Rome when Harvey was uh, spending a year with the family in Rome. I had gone to Rome, as a matter of fact. You talk about synchronous kinds of behavior. I had decided to go to Rome because I had thought that, that was the pathway that all American artists had to take to see the experience of European art firsthand. And where else would you go except to the place where the Renaissance flourished? Uh, and I had a studio with a friend of, of ours uh, right in the middle, in the heart of old Rome. And lo and behold, Harvey never told me about it, but suddenly <laughs> he showed up with family about halfway during the time I was there. And we spent a couple of afternoons together because he confided in me. He said, I have a hell of a time. They're all talking Italian. <laughs> and he really felt uncomfortable about all of this. Uh, and it was only later, as you see in the dates, when I had a place in Italy, we had a, a wonderful place in a small town called Pietro Santa, which was the focus of Italian sculpture, uh, that uh, I also began to paint working people, which was something that was part of our ethos. And it was interesting, too, that I'm back, back and forth about this, that while in Rome, Harvey does a portrait of uh, Lois and Rachel. And when I looked at it at the time, I thought something disturbing about it. And then revisiting it, I have never seen the original. Uh, I said to myself, there's something strange. Why did he paint this? Now, it was some kind of conflict, obviously, between the two of them that, that he felt was important to record. 
And I don't, I don't think it's, it's difficult to, to understand somebody's motivation necessarily, but it was very manifest in this painting. Uh, when Lois got her teaching job in Vassar, uh, they all moved up to Poughkeepsie. And across the river, Poughkeepsie is this rundown city called Newburgh. And of course, that drew Harvey to him immediately because of its sense of utter deprivation. And in later paintings, he was to paint a lot of New York City architecture because for him, it represented a passage in time. Uh, they, the painting beforehand also was one of my favorites because something about that lone movie theater, a light in the darkness of this town that was a rundown, terrible, dangerous town, as a matter of fact. I think Harvey was often oblivious to danger. He wound up being attacked in Prospect Park. People who were indifferent to the idea that he thought the arches of the park were <laughs> an important part of people's experience. And uh, there's a poignancy in this that I think is also part of his temperament and his understanding. Uh, all of that was interrupted by the death of his mother. And of course, he was very powerfully affected by that. And it was this image, apparently, that also affected me because I went on to do a similar painting when my mother died. And our connectedness was not necessarily via one painting as opposed to another, but because it was part of our sensibility about family. Uh, and this is somebody who I didn't know was in Harvey's family, who is also, uh, again, an extraordinary uh, musician. And Harvey glommed on to this idea of people Peggy playing music as something almost integral to his understanding of life, that music was a powerful kind of expressive device. And I think it's curious because his niece became a, a, you know, a profoundly important musician and a pianist. Uh, I don't know if he made that connection, but something about music he felt was important, although he was not interested in contemporary music necessarily. Didn't listen to the Beatles. He wasn't really aware of playing, of, of playing groups. Uh, and it carried through in a lot of his experience. I'm, I'm going forward now because I'm worried that your attention span might be lost. <laughs> but <laughs> I'm losing attention here. But, but, <laughs> uh, and this is another interesting image of a, a guy who was, he met, uh, who was a survivor, a, a, a man who had had gone through the usual experience of the great exodus from Europe, who fled tyranny, who came to this country penniless, who managed to survive all the indifference and the poverty and neglect, and who also represented something about family. And the interesting thing about this painting is I looked at it again and again, and he did a lot of paintings of this man named Mr. Meltzer, who at the time I thought, why do you keep painting this guy? You know, he's interesting. He did him with a, a prayer show called the Talus and so on. And this painting is fascinating if you look at it because the intensity with which he's painted himself is to me an extraordinary kind of uh, expression of where he needed to be in terms of his discovery and that he was somehow or other intent on getting to what Mr. Meltzer represented, which is also family. Uh, 
And I think in, in some sense it was related to all the other family issues that he had. And I'm, I'm going to this painting because, again, people would say that, you know, oh, you were hooked onto one another and you were painting what each other did and you looked at his and I looked at his and so on. But it wasn't. There was a synchrony of feeling that we had about the world, about what was paintable. Uh, however, I confess that this painting of mine on the right was seriously influenced by the painting on the left. I confess, because when I saw it, I thought it was the greatest single portrait, small painting that I had seen. And the intensity of the look and the graphic quality in it. And I didn't intend to do a parallel until the young woman on the right showed up in one of my classes. And I said, fuck it, I'm gonna, excuse me, I'm <laughs> So there we were. Uh, and then this is another wonderful painting he did also of one of his family members. I think it's one of the most uh, effective of his portraits. I was particularly taken by his portraits because I thought they did in fact make some statement beyond mere recording. Uh, and there's something about and it's ineluctable in the sense that it, you can't really explain it. It's what it feels like. It's what it says to you in so many words that are sometimes what we call spiritual, but are not really that. Uh, and also, again, it's something interesting because he put the name of the title, The Last Kobolinsky, in Hebrew, wrote it on the background. Uh, and that made it doubly interesting for me because he goddamn made Hebrew lettering so beautiful. <laughs> and I was, I was pissed at him for that, let me tell you. We, uh, I didn't show you our high school yearbook, which is filled with early drawings we did when we were 16, 17 of our classmates that showed, again, each one of us at the time were terribly competitive on who would do more of these drawings for the yearbook. And I think it was okay. It was a healthy kind of competition that lasted. It wasn't filled with anger or malevolence of any kind. Uh, and now to one of the paintings of his, I've got to speed this up because I'm anxious for you to see all of it. Harvey at one time told me that <clears throat> when he was planning this painting, he looked to older images of the great processional paintings that were done in the, in, the, in the 15th or 16th century. A lot of them were done to celebrate emperors' terrible wars on one another. And, uh, and this was an interesting, and in my looking form, I found this Dura etching. Again, you see, the, the images of some elaborate structure with horses and so on that are strung out that affected this painting. And it was done very soon in his early in his career. And I considered it one of his really signature pieces of art, something that established him as a major artist. Why is that? Because in this incredible fashion, he summarized all of the craziness, the energy, the sexuality, the protest, everything that encompassed the decade of, or, of the 80s. And the connection is lost, of course. So I'll play it. Okay, thank you. All right, I've got fingers that do strange things. Uh, and all of, the, of all of the paintings that he had, he had done, uh, not only in the complexity of it, but in the scale. I thought it approached the idea of the monumental image that was necessary for him in thinking about painting, 
and the art of the period. Uh, I'm not sure that any of you share that affection, but these, these images themselves, the use of the idea of the skeleton also as a premonitory kind of focus on what could happen in American art. The whole idea of, of its imposing possibility of death. Um, I didn't touch it this time. I, I got news for you. <clears throat> My hands are free. I'm going to look at that. <laughs> I'm breathing heavily. Uh, it, it, this is a photograph I saw recently. By the way, just as a side note, this painting was exhibited in 1973 at his gallery in uh, New York City. I didn't see it there. I saw it a few years later when the City Museum of New York put on an exhibition called 200 Years of American Illustration. And the painting has appeared in an illustration show, which probably pissed Harvey off enormously. <laughs> But it illustrated something about the inevitable connection that we have with the whole history of art. It's about illustration, folks. It's got nothing to do with spirituality, with uh, self-expression, with any of those things. It's about telling stories. And the story Harvey tells encompasses so many issues about the way we live and he's feeling about it. But I, when I saw this photograph, I said, son of a bitch, I don't know how he painted up on a ladder. I got news for you. And, uh, all right, I'm, I'm going to go back in time again. This is after Harvey's first visit to Rome. He did these couple of paintings, again, that were part of his interest in the, in the ordinary person, the worker. And he found something about that bent over figure, the old man, that clearly drew him to this particular devotion. And then he also painted in the Piazza del Fiore, uh, which was in fact uh, uh, the center for a lot of people selling fruits and vegetables and so on in the marketplace. And curiously, years later, I also, in Pietra Santa, I also did the same thing. Again, because the parallels of our understanding were like, and uh, you don't have time to really make a comparison here, but the sensibilities in both their paintings are different, and, uh, but I present them as the idea that we shared kinds of interests in painting that was inescapable. Uh, what was not shared was Harvey's fascination with the architecture of, of the park, of Prospect Park. You think of someone going to make a park painting, be a lot of trees. Well, for somehow or other, there are not a lot of trees in the paintings he did of Prospect Park. But this painting, I feel, is also a parallel to the parade painting in the sense and you'd have to see it in the flesh, as in fact, you have to see paintings like this, because there's something premonitory, dangerous, scary about this painting. It's about the end. I don't know whether he painted it because of that, but the fact of this archway looming towards nothing, not towards greenery, not towards sunshine, towards a field of snow. Uh, and I'm not sure, I never talked to him about the painting because in point of fact, I had never seen it. Uh, which is another interesting characteristic of our relationship is that a lot of things that he did, he did not share with me uh, for reasons that are perhaps arcane or difficult to understand. Uh, And he did other paintings of the same architecture in the park. 
And this is, again, uh, I think, a figure for itself and Lois, going through that arch of life that he so clearly felt was part of his own future. And there's another group of paintings, again, part of his, his large figure paintings that he did as a programmatic kind of expression of where he wanted to be as an artist. And the guy on the right is an old school chum of us named Arnold Abramson, who was, became uh, the chief uh, uh, producer of scenic art for Broadway shows. And he was given, in fact, recently, I wish I'd shown the photograph, uh, an award, a Tony Award, for, for excellence in scenic art. And I'm pleased to show it because he's one of the people in the group that came from that high school of music and art. And then he did a, a, a similar, uh, and these are pastel portraits, by the way, and they're, <clears throat> as you see, 74 friggin' inches high, which has not been done with pastel. And this is an extraordinary kind of uh, confidence in the, me in the medium and how it was to be able to, pre to project the same things that, and I think he did it partly because it just was different. It was a, a challenge. Uh, and in, in all of the instances in which he worked, he did something that was, in effect, a challenge for him. He did a lot of these life-size standing form uh, paintings in a period, a six-year period, which is astonishing because if you see the size of the painting, it would be an achievement beyond measure for most artists. And of course, I had my nose in the same issue because I also did these relatively large-scale paintings of the people in village in Pietra Santa. And particularly, I did a lot of paintings of the bicycle riders because they were part of a crazy race that took place every year in the town where guys on bicycles would go up the mountainside, which is a narrow road, and often bump each other off the road in order to win the race. And of course, it would produce the kind of anxiety that was in this figure. And this particular woman on the right uh, was one of my favorite paintings because it expressed so much about the life in the town I lived. And it was, this painting in particular that struck me, he called it North Earthbound, and I never asked him about it. Uh, and again, I saw it not in, the, in, the, in reality. I don't know what happened. I was never able to see more than a few paintings when I visited him in the studio. But it clearly was a difference of a kind of male portrait in an era when, God help me, I don't want to see another rear end of a female nude in public <laughs> art. Enough, enough. There's a, a, a <laughs> never mind. In, in a school devoted to life drawing and life painting, I understand it. But why the hell does an instruction take place with people with clothes on? There's enough to learn just from painting what elements in a fold in a jacket are important in portraying a human form. Why not? Why? And it sounds like I'm some kind of, you know, idiot, uh, uh, anti-sex person. I am not. I've done enough of my nudes to know that it can be elicit a sort of uh, an erogenous feeling. But I'm telling you that there's something misplaced. I think if you want to study architecture, go to the web and get a whole series of drawings, of, of diagrams of, of, of body forms. You can do that. You have to see it in motion. You have to see it twisted on the ground. You have to see it. I did a painting of a female nude recently. It was in my show. 
from the rear, because I said, God damn it, I could paint a woman's rear end just as well as anybody else. <laughs> but I did it with people making love. Because why not? All of the other paintings of nude are incipient kinds of celebrations of sexuality. So I'll paint something, and not only that, but I made the painting with a female astride a male because I wanted to show something about the, the, the fact that you can, you can be a woman and originate all the activity. Okay? No one's smiling. <laughs> so, the, the idea of this painting of the male was fascinating to me. First of all, because it painted male genitalia, which was virtually unknown. Uh, and I think it's also because he was an old man, and the idea of his sexuality still being part of him, I think was not conscious when Harvey did it. He was just interested in this, this the architecture of this male figure. But I think it's a lot of, lot of things that happen in painting that are, if you want, in the unconscious. And, and so when he painted one of the people who he encountered in the, in, in, uh, I don't know who this guy was, he called it the veteran. But <clears throat> years later I would paint a working man also with a paunch, again, it didn't matter that I, whether I'd seen that painting or not. It was where we were both at in saying, why not paint the male figure with flesh? Why not paint it, you know, so it's, it's, it's not out of bounds. Uh, whatever else may or may not come from that kind of... Uh, okay. I think we're getting close, folks. This, this painting, by the way, Harvey's, uh, I never thought, I never looked at it quite clearly. Uh, very early on, when we shared a studio together, uh, he said, let's paint each other. And I started a painting of his, also a life-size, and I abandoned it. And he finished his painting. I could not find a... a uh, a photograph of it. Uh, and then here it was, literally 30 years later, where again, his peremptory call on the telephone, he said, Bert, let us paint, let's paint each other's portrait. I said, yeah, that's a nice idea, Harvey. I, I thought that was great. So, <laughs> so this was the result. And the curious thing, is that I never looked at it closely, but he viewed me as somehow or other in control. My arms folded like I knew what the hell was going on. <laughs> I had no idea what was going on in the world. And he sits in the background, which is supposed to be uh, just a painting of me, and he's there again as a guardian, somebody watching out for me. Uh, and I thought, maybe I misunderstood everything about our long relationship. Maybe I just didn't know all the things I thought he knew about him. I knew about him, and, and it was a kind of shock, in a way. Uh, just to change temperament, and I'm going to really end this very quickly, uh, because there's got to be time for you to ask me questions. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> in the midst of all of this, is somewhere, in, and I had to ask Steve Assel, who you may know is a great painter, about this, because he led this protest against the Whitney Museum, in which uh, uh, over 1,500 people came in front of the Whitney Museum 
to protest what? The fact that they had excluded American artists, namely American realism, from their, 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 their collection of what was called American art. Uh, the Whitney finally came to its senses and did a lot of, a lot of, <clears throat> uh, of what's his name's paintings. I'm looking at what we have to do and I'm going to switch to another painting that I think also is a powerful image. And this was stimulated by the, uh, uh, Walt Whitman's poetry, Ferry to Brooklyn. I never read the poem. Just as an aside, by the way, I didn't know about Harvey. He was an extremely interested reader of both poetry and past things that were ri written about. He was an assiduous collector of information uh, and, and was a, 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 a revelation in a way that all of his characteristics, his, his, his attention to detail, which was sometimes unnerving to me because it's the very opposite of personality that I am. Uh, but this painting also was so predictive of his sense of the passage of time and the fact that he had accumulated all the people on, uh, who had ever painted as part of this ferry, this gloomy boat heading, in, heading into a sunset, which was, again, his anxiety, his premonitory feeling about the future um, that, uh, that I think is, is also an extraordinary bit of painting. And also, again, the painting is not small. And I think Harvey's idea of uh, memorializing, or, or it's the wrong word, of making the impact with his art had to be of a certain scale. Um, this is just a reminder of his incredible skills as a draftsman, from the early things he did in Rome, the marketplace, to the, the head studies that he did, to this drawing, which I own, by the way, uh, which was the result of, of a, a transaction. He'd uh, seen a painting in auction of uh, Rachel that he couldn't afford to buy, and he asked me, because historically, I had somehow rather been his banker of record. And so I said, yeah, I have a little extra money, I can get it for you. And uh, he said, and I want to give you something in exchange. So he invited me to a studio, and he opened up two or three, I can't be sure, portfolios of drawing. And I went through it, and I could not decide. There was an rate of art that was astounding, that in itself would be an exhibition, all by itself as some friggin' museum decided to get real about what American art should be. Uh, and it's a, it's a wonderful drawing that combines both the incidental with the beautifully detailed and sensitive study of this woman. Uh, this is one of the, the late photographs of Harvey that I think is indicative of, way of who he was as a personality, as you may have encountered him in his teaching, as his, because there's this curious interest in you, but it's also a searching interest. It's like, who are you? And what, why are you about? And what do you believe? And what do you feel? And what is your thing in life? And what are you after? Uh, he was always someone to ask questions. And it, the fact that he's not out there in this great expanse, but turned inward at the same time. Uh, 
which I think is, is something that often is out off-putting or often was off-putting about him. And the final image is one that I was reluctant to show you, but when I saw Harvey in the hospital when he was ill, uh, he was very pale, a uh, very faint, frail, and lying, <clears throat> sucking on a lollipop. And then he had a phone connection, the phone rang. And he got on the phone, and there was something about this combination of both this child and this man at the end of his life that just overwhelmed me. And I didn't have anything to draw with, so I surreptitiously, of course, photographed him. And then <clears throat> was reluctant to draw it because I thought drawings of people at the end of their life is exploded. But uh, the, 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 this, the, the pain in his face is just the effort to lift the phone. He was so frail, if you see, the arm that I drew was almost down to the bone. Uh, and it's the last, next to the last image I had of him. Uh, I saw him again when he was <clears throat> in hospice in Manhattan, and uh, he, before he came back home, uh, and then died very soon thereafter. So, folks, the line that I wrote at the end of it, that's printed, je ne regrette rien, which is what he said to me, when I was talking with him about all the things we'd experienced, you know, a lifetime. And uh, he said it as a kind of final sense of himself that I thought was interesting. It's an EFP off song that he remembered. And it raised questions for me because Je regrette tout. <laughs> okay, thank you folks for your, your